many ways in localization. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, let me thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak at this really interesting conference, uh, which has had many great talks already, so the bar has been set very high. So I hope I can live up to that expectation, also giving a Blackboard talk, which I don't do that all that often because usually I end up showing a lot of numerical data. Um, but showing data is apparently not allowed here, so I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to try to introduce the concepts of many-body localization. So the idea of my talk is to explain what many-body localization means. And so uh, I, I, you know, the goal is that everybody understands it at the end. So if something is unclear, please do ask me. Um, and um, I'm going to present the perspective on many bit of localization that I developed together with Chetan Nayak. And if you want to know any details or look at the actual numerical results, um, I would point you to this um, paper. Now, many body localization is a very active field of research right now, so a lot of people are working on it, many of whom are in the audience. And Gifri already listed the people in the audience who are working on this, so I'm not going to repeat that. And I'm just going to not. Uh, mention any references basically throughout the talk. Um, but I can give you the references if you're interested, or you can look them up in our paper. Um, and I want to start out by giving a bit of a motivation for why we would want to study uh, many-body localization. There are two kind of uh, complementary perspectives on why this is an interesting problem. And then at the very end of the talk, I'm going to be more specific and uh, explain why we at Station Q are interested in studying many-body localization, which may not seem very obvious from the beginning of the talk. So one perspective is that of uh, quantum statistical mechanics. Um, so in particular, the question of how thermodynamics or statistical mechanics can arise in a closed quantum system, which is, of course, a very old question. And uh, many-body localization is, is kind of another angle to look at this and, in particular, answer the question, give some answer to the question, for what, where, in which systems thermodynamics can emerge in the closed quantum systems and in which systems it actually fails. And many-body localization will provide maybe one of the few examples of an interacting system where this emergence of, of statistical mechanics completely fails. But let me first discuss a little bit of what we would um, expect in a kind of a generic clean interacting quantum many-body system. Um, this often goes by the name of ETH, Eigenstate Thermalization Hypothesis, which was put forward by Deutsch and Swidnicki in the early 90s. Um, and I'm going to give a very, um, very weak definition of, of eigenstate thermalization. Um, so we consider some large quantum system. And this is a closed quantum system. So this is somehow perfectly isolated from the environment. And I'm going to put this in a pure state. And this is going to be some eigenstate to some Hamiltonian. And I want this eigenstate to be really highly excited. So I want this to have a finite energy density above the ground state. So if I take first the energy density above the ground state per volume of the system should be larger than zero. So don't imagine you know, putting a few local excitations in there, but imagine putting an extensive number of local excitations into the system. This is really a key point. Now, um, globally, the system is in a pure state, doesn't have any entropy. So you know, there's no notion of thermodynamics or statistical mechanics there. But we can now cut out some region of the system. Let's call this region A and this region B. Um, and the claim is that if you look at quantities local in region A, um, those look thermal. So if you look at the reduced density matrix for A, so trace out everything in B, and this is close to some Gibbs ensemble. And so this Hamiltonian generically will be um, this Hamiltonian restricted to region A. Um, and this inverse temperature beta here will depend in some way on the energy density above the ground state that are kind of globally put into the system. Um, and so the expectation is that this is actually very generic behavior. Um, so how could, I, how could I check this? Well, one thing you could do is you could um, calculate local observables and compare local observables against the, uh, um, just the, the Gibbs ensemble. And you would see that um, 
calculating the local observable in an eigenstate will, to some accuracy that depends on the size of the system, um, match expectation values either drawn from the microcanonical ensemble or a canonical ensemble for some inverse temperature. Um, maybe in this uh, audience, the more intuitive way to look at this is to calculate the entanglement entropy of this reduced density matrix and then observe that this follows a, vo follows a volume law. So the entanglement entropy here is proportional to the volume of this region A. This is not what we're used to thinking about in tensor networks, where we're usually dealing with ground states of local hematonians which have an area law. But the important thing to emphasize maybe at this point, this may be preaching to the choir, but it's really important to keep in mind that this area law is something that's extremely specific to ground states of local hematonians. If you just take a random uh, quantum state, it'll have a volume law. If you take a generic quantum system and take a highly excited eigenstate, it'll have a volume law. You can maybe think of systems that are completely diagonal in the product basis that will not have this, but then you can add a small perturbation and you immediately get a volume law. So this volume law is really an extremely generic property if you're away from the ground state. Um, and having this violated would be a very strong indication of having quantum statistical mechanics break down. And indeed, we're going to see that many body localization is an example of that. Um, can I ask you a quick question? Sorry. Yes, please. Very basic. So when you say you do or do not have thermodynamics, do you just mean Gibbs distribution? Yeah. That's what you have in mind. So yeah. So we don't yeah. have thermodynamics. By, by we have thermodynamics, I mean basically that something like this holds and then local expe expectation values local in A will match some Gibbs distribution. The Gibbs distribution, you have extensibility. And yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, now there's a second and maybe historically more, you know, the, the perspective that would first come to mind when you think about localization is that of transport. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when you think about what, what should a localized system be, it should be a system that does not transport charge or does not transport energy. Um, so, how is this connected? Um, and you, you can actually connect these, at least on a hand-waving level, uh, but in a very intuitive way. So imagine some disordered system. So let's just take 1D electrons. Um, let's put them in a strong disordered potential. So that um, if they are non-interacting, all eigenstates are localized, just a 1D Anderson insulator. Um, and now let's, just for the sake of argument, add weak interactions. Okay, so I have some disorder potential. And now imagine you have an electron sitting here that is trying to make a hop over to this side. If this picture of having um, kind of thermodynamics emerge locally in your system is accurate, what that means is that the electrons in region B can serve as a heat bath for the electrons in region A. So if you apply that notion over here, this electron could now, in a sense, borrow some energy from that large heat bath that it's surrounded by. And borrow that energy, make the hop over this barrier, and end up over here. So is this the potential in that region A that you drew schematically? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what this, what this means is that this notion of having you know, the system act as its own heat bath, so region B acting as the heat bath for region A, um, is incompatible with having electrons localized in the sense of Anderson localization. So, Localization and uh, let me call this ETH, so thermodynamics and closed quantum system, those are really incompatible. Um, so one of the two must give way. Right? So there's two possibilities. If I have 1D electrons in this limit, well, either um, localization gets destroyed because interactions lead to something, you know, lead to the validity of this picture and lead to something like variable range hopping, which would be similar to coupling the system to phonons. Um, and so localization would be destroyed by interactions. The alternative picture is that ETH breaks down. So if you consider highly excited states of such a system, all of what I said here would not apply anymore. Um, right. So basically the question now is which of these two scenarios is realized? Does localization pre uh, prevail or does uh, 
feminization prevail. And um, this was actually, if, if you look at the introduction of Anderson's paper in 1958, you see that he already realized this. He already says that an Anderson insulator is the first example of a system where thermodynamics or statistical mechanics breaks down. Because that's a non-interacting case, and the question of whether you know, that survives in the interacting case has been open basically for 50 years since. Um, and then maybe this is the only reference I'm going to put down. Um, there was a seminal paper by Basco, Alana, and Altschuler in uh, 2006 um, who made huge progress on answering this question and claimed that indeed if you add interactions, um, localization prevails, at least for weak enough interactions, and uh, statistical mechanics would break down. Um, and so I want to spend another couple of minutes on explaining the picture that was put forward by Basco, Alana, and Altschuler. Um, then try to explain why using that picture in a numerical calculation is very difficult and why it doesn't give a very transparent understanding of what a many-body localized state is. And then um, finally connect kind of to the topics of this conference and explain how we can um, obtain a better understanding of, of many-body localization. Maybe not so much using tensor network states, but at least using a language that is very much inspired by tensor network states. So that's hopefully going to connect uh, back to the other topics of this conference. So the perspective that uh, was discussed in this paper is that of localization in Fox space. There's actually a very old concept that was discussed in the 80s to understand localization in mesoscopic systems, so to understand crossover and level statistics and quantum dots. Um, and then the achievement of this paper was to apply this same language to an extended system and somehow take the thermodynamic limit in a controlled way. So what do I mean by that? Um, so let me think about a Hamiltonian that has this form. So I have some, let me just uh, take, uh, say, spinless fermions. So I have some non-interacting uh, disordered fermion Hamiltonian. And now I add some kind of weak interaction. So this lambda is going to be uh, much weaker than the disorder. And this is some kind of physically local interaction term between the fermions. Now, I could imagine solving this single particle problem. So I'm going to find uh, the slated determinants that solve this. So a quick question here. Yes? So when you say, uh, Disorder, you mean there is on-site random potentials so is the Yeah, I mean, it, the, the specific type of disorder doesn't matter so much. I want this to be an Anderson insulator. So let's say uncorrelated. I mean, the simplest case would be uncorrelated diagonal disorder. Um, you, know, you could probably also take a quasi-disordered system. The details shouldn't really matter that much. But if it's not diagonal, it could be seen as an interaction. Well, I think there's some confusion in the literature. So if you look at Anderson's papers, he calls hopping interaction. Um, yeah, and by interaction, I mean a term that involves four fermions. Four. Four. So this is a bunch of two fermion operators, and this is quadratic in fermion operators, and this is quartic in fermion operators. Um, right. So I have some set of slated determinants. I'm going to call these alpha. These are occupation number vectors um, in terms of some orbitals that solve this single particle problem. And so there's two to the L of these. And now using these, I could rewrite equi completely equivalently this Hamiltonian in the following form. So now I have some completely diagonal part here in the slated determinant. This is just the single particle part of it. Um, and then the interaction now looks like this. So if you look at this Hamiltonian, this looks exactly like what we expect the Anderson Hamiltonian to look like, the non-interacting Anderson Hamiltonian. Of course, what I've done is just a trick. I had a system that started out on L sites, 
and that is interacting. Now I have a non-interacting system, but it's on two to the L sides. So computationally, I haven't made anything easier. I've just rewritten it in a different language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, say this is symmetric. Um, but the picture put forward in this Pascal and Altula paper is that this is actually a very useful representation um, of the Hamiltonian. And the idea is that um, you could think of many-body localization as localization on some very complicated graph that's defined by this Hamiltonian. So these V alpha beta, uh, these define some kind of graph um, on which this single particle problem lives. This is some random, possibly highly coordinated graph of 2D L sites. Um, and so you could now try and solve a uh, Anderson localization problem on random graphs, on beta lattices, on all kinds of things that you would think approximate this. Um, and you could try to understand many-body localization in this way. And um, you know, then you could apply all the machinery that you have for single particle localization. You could calculate inverse participation ratios and so on, and try to see whether that gives you any insights into many body localization. Now it turns out that um, analytically, at least, you know, in this perturbative calculation of Pascal, Leiner, and Altschuler, this is a useful perspective. But um, if you try to use this numerically, you don't get much out of it. So. You know, this is some extremely complicated graph. You can try to analyze the structure of this graph. You find that it has an extensive coordination number. Um, so you have, as you grow the system size, the coordination of this graph grows. So that already sounds pretty ill-defined. Um, if you calculate inverse participation ratios, you, you see that, you know, all the eigenstates are actually delocalized in some very strict sense, and maybe you could analyze the precise scaling. But it all turns out to be very difficult. So the, making this notion of localization and Fox space precise in this sense turns out to be very hard. So what we then thought is maybe we can um, make that more precise by using a language of tensor network states, or a language at least inspired by tensor network states. Yes. In the limit lambda equal to zero, you would lose this interaction, right? Yeah. So if lambda is very small, do you get any insight at all? This, this graph, does, does it simplify at all, or it's just complicated times lambda? It's just complicated times small, you know. I mean, then, then what, so what Pascal and Alcina do is they take this and they simplify this. So they kind of cut off this interaction in space and in energy. Um, and if you simplify this enough, you end up with a problem that's perturbatively tractable. Um, but numerically, if you try to go beyond that, it turns out to be really hard. Um, but the, the idea that, that this gives you is that um, the many-body localized states are somehow slightly washed out in Fox space from uh, the states of some adjacent Anderson insulator. Right, so you have, you have Fox space. If you have um, a non-interacting problem, your ground state is just a point in this. If you, have, if you now add interactions, it kind of gets washed out a little bit. Um, but it doesn't get washed out em enough to change the properties of the system fundamentally. So it doesn't get washed out enough to lead to transport and so on. Yes? So I understand this whole point is that I need to run back to the L terms, but, but physically there's always, if, if you have some localized things, things will kind of maybe hop or it will kind of act close by, but, but you will act like the identity far away. Yes. So just to map, even to model this in this language, you need exponentially many terms because the identity kind of has exponentially many terms far away. So. So you would kind of think that this is not a very useful way to exponentially many terms. So they can only be polynomially. I mean, there's at least n to the four non-vanishing terms here anyway. Right? There's only n to the four four Fermi operators you can write. But wait, this is this this is basically a way of encoding the four Fermi term. So I think the question is, what's the size of h? But this is not a pure thing. Yeah, that very to this is exactly the same matrix as this, just written in a different basis. So the, the epsilon alphas are not the one particle. No, they're sums of one particle yeah, energies. Sums of one particle yeah, 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 indeed. So, so epsilon is alpha is the sum of the single particle energies of all the occupied orbitals mm -hmm. in some slater determinate alpha. So, so, so it's very really huge. If you just take the free non-interacting case, and you add one interaction between two sides, just two sides, mm -hmm. then it, it won't have a clear structure. The locality. Won't, won't reflect nicely on this V alpha beta, right? 
Uh, no, it will. It will, it will. be simple. So the, the graph will be fairly simple. And so, so but, but this will. mixes terms that slater determines that differ by at most two orbitals. Right, but there are many of those, right? Yeah, but if they, if they differ in very far away places, then this is going to be very small. Okay. So individual terms are nice, but when you put all the local terms together, then that's Yeah. Basically, the complication comes from the fact that if you, you know, one fermion can only hop to a few other places, but you have extensively many fermions, and you have to multiply all the places where they can hop. And that's where the fact that this is extensive coordination comes from. Um, OK. But the, the picture here that I should think of these um, inter states of the interacting system as somehow washed out a little bit in Fox space is very much akin to the way we think about the uh, ground state of a gapped and topologically non-trivial system. Right? So the way you would think about that is you have You have some topo you know, I don't want to deal with topological systems at this point. That's going to come in later. Um, so a ground state of such a system, just a completely trivial state, um, is basically related to product states. So I can think of that as you know, a superposition of a bunch of product states, basically. But this notion is, of course, made precise by tensor network states. Um, and one way to uh, think about this is that there's an adiabatic path tuning between some Hamiltonian over here, I'm introducing some parameter and say this is for s equal to 1, and some, per some other Hamiltonian over here, and all the, uh, the ground state of this Hamiltonian is simply a product state. And you want this to be gapped, and you want a gap path between, uh, between these two Hamiltonians. Um, and then you can write some kind of adiabatic time evolution operator that goes from uh, the product states that is completely trivial to the ground states of your gapped and topologically trivial Hamiltonian. Um, and so this notion we would like to apply also to understanding the eigenstates of a many-body localized system as kind of related by some adiabatic uh, continuation to the eigenstates of an Anderson insulator. So I want to relate MBL eigenstates to Anderson insulator. Now this notion doesn't apply quite straightforwardly, right? Um, here I was talking about the ground state, so thinking about is a ground state that's separated from the rest of the spectrum by a gap makes sense. Here I'm talking about arbitrary high energy eigenstates of the system. So you know, the, the bandwidth is polynomially large in the system size. The number of states is exponential. So just by that counting argument, the gaps to adjacent states must be exponentially small. So there's no way I can think of something like a gap path. But what I can think about is a relation given by finite depth local unitary circuits. So the way I want to define this relation, so this is some kind of notion of adiabatically connected. And uh, the technically useful thing that I can do for excited eigenstates is think about states that are related by finite depth local unitary circuits. So what I mean, I mean this is probably pretty obvious in this audience, is something that looks like this. So I'm going to call this vertical direction the depth. So I want this to be too local. Do you, do you consider a, a different uh, unitary circuit for each eigenstate? I'm going to come to that. That's a very good question. Uh, I, will, I will talk about that in a minute. Um, but in, yeah, in, at this point, I want to allow that. At this point, I just want to continue states of an interacting system into localized states of some free fermion system. And in principle, I just can allow myself a different unitary for every state. Um, so this is, of course, kind of the same as, you know, the notion of having a gapped path and some adi adiabatic connection, you can turn into this notion by just, you know, expanding that unitary operator. 
totalizing it, and that will give you a finite depth rule for unitary, where the depth is basically the time, so that's going to be related to the inverse gap. Yes. Is it the fact that you will allow finite depth only related to the fact that you will only treat finite localization? I mean, strictly localized states. The so states have to be strictly localized by the um, well, there's a bit of a trick here. So I'm not continuing to product states, but to eigenstates of an Anderson's level, which can have exponential tails. So the, the reason of not writing product states over here is that I can kind of push the whole problem of dealing with exponential tails into the existing literature on Anderson insulators. And there is existing literature that relates these to product states. That's, that's why this doesn't say product states over here. So um, yes. Do you really mean what you just said that the the time would be related to the inverse gap. I, I think that's not what you want in this situation. Well, in, in this non state case, it is. But in the in the many body localized case, that's not going to be. I don't I don't think that's really what you want. It, it doesn't have to be by adiabatic here. You really need this quasi adiabatic right notion. Uh, yeah, these things. So, I mean, because if the time would be related to the inverse gap, it would be really bad. So. But you don't need that. So the claim is basically that <coughs> many body localization can be defined in a useful way where you know this depth is somehow not related to But in the ground state case it's also not related. It's also not related? Okay. Thanks. Um, right. So question? Yes. In your definition of management state it's uh, state of determinant or localized Yes. Yes. So won't the tails to decay faster than a polynomial? Um, So, yeah. so let me just write down the definition that we propose for many body localized state. So I require that, so I'm going to call this state many body localized if there exists some finite depth loop unitary that will almost everywhere transform psi in terms of, into some slater determinant to desired accuracy. So you're probably wondering now why these caveats, why they're almost everywhere, and why the, well, the to desired accuracy is probably more obvious. Um, and I'm going to come to why these are important in a minute. They actually turn out to be pretty important to have a reliable definition. Bella? Yes. So, by state now, you mean a particular state, or do you mean a phase of matter, or what do you mean? At this point, I mean a particular eigenstate of some Hamiltonian. So, but for a particular ground, uh, eigenstate of a Hamiltonian, you don't need a definition of any body localization, right? I mean, if it's just a state, you could say this is, this is um, a product state deformed by a quantum circuit. I mean, that's basically what I'm saying. I, I know, I know, but, but I mean, this, this notion, um, does not have to be attached to the phenomenon of many body localization. It happens there, but it's much more general, right? You're saying you have a quantum sta a state that can be transformed into a product state, um, yeah. or almost a product state. Right. Maybe not. I mean, yes, so the point is these are the eigenstates of this. No, I don't, no, no, but, but I'm, I'm going to use this definition to define a many body localized system given by some Hamiltonian as one where almost all eigenstates fulfill this definition. So I'm using this as a stepping stone to get to the definition of a many-body localized phase. And, and what you're saying is this concept should not be very strange to us? Or? No, no. Th I mean, for this audience, this should be completely familiar. Yeah, if you give this to other audiences, they're like, what the hell is all this? But uh, right. yeah. Okay. I mean, this is like, this would actually be my first corollary now of this definition. So the first thing that you see is that this is basically saying that these states have an MPS description in one dimension. 
right? Because an MPS is nothing else than a finite depth local unitary applied to a product state. So for this audience, I could have probably just said, in one dimension, the eigenstates are described by matrix product states. Right? All eigenstates, not just the ground state, all eigenstates of the system are described by matrix product states. Now, there's of course a bit of a caveat here um, when you want to do simulations, which is how do you find this matrix product state. So this definition suggests that it should exist, but of course, you know, it's some state in the middle of the spectrum, and finding it would be very hard. And Gifri explained yesterday how you would do it if you were given some uh, constants of motion of the Hamiltonian, but in general, how to do that is still an open problem, and you know, there may or may not be a solution to that. Um, this also immediately implies that uh, these states have an area law. Right, so finite depth local unitary can only add so much entanglement to the system. Product state has zero entanglement, so these must have an area law. And this is a very important consequence because this definition, you know, if you just give me a state, this is hard to check numerically. I don't know how to construct this unitary uh, very efficiently, but if I'm given the state, I can just measure the entropy. So this gives me a numerical way to uh, study many body localization. And this is, of course, what we were aiming for here also. Um, if you look at the definitions of many body localization given by Baskerlein and Altschuler, all of those, you know, that's like transport. I don't know how to calculate transport efficiently um, in a strongly interacting disordered system. Um, I do know how to calculate entanglement entropies reasonably efficiently. So this gives me a good way to check numerically. Yes. Actually, I have a question about eigenstates in the, in the middle of the spectrum. This is not a well-defined concept, though, because you have like <laughs> yeah. example, right? so you can always take linear combinations of them, and that's still an eigenstate because you have yeah. infinitely many there. So yeah. is that more saying that there exists a linear combination of those that gives right. you matrix products? That's actually a very good question. So that's something we're thinking about right now. Um, you know, if you think about something that you could do in a lab in finite time, you can only prepare eigenstates to some accuracy. So you're going to have a superposition of eigenstates in an energy window. And the question is, does that tell you something about localization? And it turns out that it does. So you can read off signs of localization from approximate eigenstates as well. Um, so you can kind of, for example, you can see an area law emerge in states that you can prepare in polynomial time by a quantum circuit, starting from a product state. Um, I don't want to deal with that question in this talk, maybe, but we've been thinking about how to study all this on a quantum computer where that comes up. And I'd be happy to explain that um, maybe in private. Um, Right. So another in interesting point here is uh, I've allowed this uh, unitary U to be different for every eigenstate. Um, now let's additionally assume that I have some Hamiltonian H. H and uh, U is the same for all eigenstates. Eigenstates. Right, so this is a slightly stronger definition. I'm not allowing myself to choose a U for every state, but I want to have one U that acts on the whole spectrum and transform it, transforms it to product states. So now you can take this Hamiltonian H, you can uh, conjugate it by that unitary, you get some new Hamiltonian H tilde. Now this Hamiltonian H tilde, all its eigenstates are basically product states, so it should be diagonal in some local basis. So, you know, I can just assume that that basis is Z, and then what I get is that this H tilde looks like this. So it's a sum of products of Pauli Z operators. Now this will, of course, look very familiar from uh, Giffre's talk yesterday. Uh, so these are the, these sigmas are the local constants of motion. Well, I haven't said local yet, but there, there are at least constants of motion under this Hamiltonian H tilde. You can convince yourself that they're local by calculating some operator that's... Um, so this is, you know, on a side in this new lattice here. This is a finite depth operator, so it has a light cone. So this can only transform a local operator into a local operator. So physically, these operators sigma z are... Um, local in the original letters. So what that means is that if I assume that this U is the same for all states, our definition implies the definition um, via local conserved quantities. You can also go the other way, uh, but that's actually much harder. So I'm not going to go into that. 
I'm assuming there's no mobility edge indeed. Yeah, if you have a mobility edge, I think it gets tricky. So it's sort of a strong form of the points. Yeah. This is indeed very strong. So I've assumed here that there's no mobility edge. I've also assumed that I can kind of forget about my almost everywhere. And to, you know, in this definition, I'm going to see that I actually need to allow regions where this definition is not, does not apply. And so I don't quite know what happens if you carefully treat these constants of motions, given that you have regions where kind of the definition doesn't apply. So I've, I've assumed a very strong version of our definition. And then I can, then it implies the constants of motion. No. So I'm, I'm, well, I'm not allowed to show any numerical data. If I were, I could now show that, um, let's say there are phases of matter that are consistent with this definition in the sense of having an area law for all eigenstates. Um, so this would be the canonical thing to do now. Um, the statement is with probability 1. Hmm? The statement is with probability 1. Yes. yes. Um, so, right. You, you can now take some uh, canonical system, you know, three fermions on a chain with the next nearest neighbor interaction. Um, you can study the area law. Uh, so, you just look at the entanglement in the system and you see that there's a parameter regime where you have finite interactions, but on all the system sizes that are accessible. Um, it's consistent with many body localization. But you can also make the interactions very strong and drive it out of this phase. So you can drive delocalization by making very strong interactions. Um, so you know there, there's a kind of a finite window. This is for some particular model. Um, other authors have actually looked at entanglement properties and detected mobility edges. Right? So Frank has worked on that. Instead of looking at the area law, you look at kind of by fluctuations around it, you look at the variance of the entropy, and then you can, in certain systems, at least detect a many-body mobility edge so that not all eigenstates states are local. Okay, so, so. You just mentioned for all system sizes that can be analyzed. Um, so is, is, should we co be concerned that maybe this is a finite size effect, or right. do you have a, an opinion about that? Well, you should always be concerned about finite size effects. Um, <laughs> There's a hand-waving argument that um, it's unlikely to find a scenario where, you know, if, if you plot entanglement entropy and let's say plot the mean as a function of system size, you know, you see an area law and then it takes off. That this seems extremely unlikely, right? Because then locally the system would have to be localized, and at large scales, it somehow delocalization has to happen. That seems extremely unlikely, um, but I cannot prove that it doesn't happen. So the, the more likely scenario, and the one that you see in the numerics, is that you have some kind of growth at small system sizes, and then it saturates uh, to an area. So this is supposed to be perfectly flat. So that, you know, that gives us some trust that in this direction we can kind of trust um, the numerics, even for a relatively small system. I mean, numerically, you know, this is like up to 18 sites or so. Because we have to do full diagonalization, very, very time consuming. Now, um, what I've plotted here is the following. So I'm, I'm calculating some eigenstate of the system and uh, cutting it somewhere. So I have two blocks, and then I calculate the entanglement entropy for this. Right? So now, what I'm plotting, what I'm kind of sketching here, is the scenario where I always cut in the center of an open chain. And then I average over eigenstates. And then I average over disorder realizations. And then I observe an area law. There's a different thing I can do. Um, I can take the maximum over L. This is little l. Average that over eigenstates. And then average that over disorder. Right, so instead of always cutting in the same place, which is kind of cutting in an average place, I maximize over the place where I cut in the system. And very interestingly, then you observe a completely different scaling. So then instead of seeing an area law, you see something that looks like log L. So for every eigenstate, nearly every eigenstate, I can find a place where I can cut the system such that the entropy is not quite extensive, but scales in some very slow way with the system size. 
And so that now tells you why we put all these caveats in the definition, in particular this almost everywhere. So I cannot require that the system has an area law everywhere, or that it, it's you know, related to a product state everywhere. Um, but I have some kind of very small fraction of the system, and you know, in this, numerically it looks like that's basically log L over L, so it's a vanishing fraction of the system in the thermodynamic limit, but there are still kind of regions where the system violates um, an area law and has kind of a, a sub-extensive but growing entropy. Um, there's a, I just want to quickly get, sketch this. There's kind of an intuitive way to understand this. Um, so you can think of this all realizations. Um, you, know, you just look at some disorder realization. You have flat regions and you have regions where the uh, disorder potential varies strongly. So you have kind of a flat region and then you have a barrier. And let's say the probability of having a barrier at a given side is P. Um, then the probability of, oh yeah, and, and so the, what defines a flat region? Um, flat means basically on the scale of the critical disorder strength, um, the, uh, the disorder potential looks flat. So it's somehow flat enough to lead to lo delocalization between the two barriers that surround this region. Um, so the probability of having, if, if, I, if I just pick a location, then the probability of being surrounded by such a region of size S is, uh, 1 minus this probability to the power s. So this probability is exponentially small. But now if I, uh, this is somewhat cutting at the center. Um, if I now look everywhere in the system, the probability of having a region of size s that's flat anywhere in the system gets an additional factor l in front. So then this probability is not just exponentially suppressed, but there's an additional logarithmic term up in the exponent. So it only becomes extremely rare uh, once you consider an S that's kind of larger than log L. So this is a hand-waving way to understand what we see in the numerics uh, by seeing this log L growth in the average maximum entropy in eigenstates. Um, OK, so I have 15 minutes. So Bella, if you take then a cut for a given eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, you take a cut, mm -hmm. and if it's in the middle always, the probability that you get log L is small, but once you get to the proper cut where this, you have log L, then presumably you have log L for, I mean, the entropy doesn't go from constant to log L um, yeah. suddenly, right? Yeah. So, so you, have a, you have all these flat regions. Log L is basically, I mean, you only saturate the log L if you happen to cut in the middle of the log L size region. Right, but if you cut one side next to it, it's going to be log L minus 1. Right? Indeed. So, yeah. so you still have, but that is above the average still. Yes. Right. yes. So does this tell you that you should expect, in, in terms of the discussion of integrals of motion, that you should expect some localized integrals of motion as well? Yes. I mean, I'm actually not completely sure how to understand this, but you know, you could maybe think that there would be integrals of motion that are strictly localized and some that spread out over log L sides. Right. Or have, at least have a have a power law decay over log L sides. So I, I, I have difficulty to, to reconcile this with this result of Joel Moore and Dewey for a long time ago, where they kind of look at the random spin chain, and there somehow they, they actually show that the environment would be as always always scales like log L. Exactly because of randomness, so the more randomness, it's it's because point. of randomness that they get. And, 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 and basically, any point. Right. Then you have a diverging number of these residences at one. Oh, I don't know. That's that's my question. That is. That, that's the difference. That you have so, diverging density of states in these residences. Here you have a number of exponential where. Yeah. I think this is a different type of disorder they're looking. They're looking at bond disorder, 
there's some sort of criticality. But here yeah, I, I think it, that's basically... If you would do the same for the site disorder, you would not see this log growth. It would just look bad. Ah, it's, bone disorder is very different than site disorder. Well, it depends. If it depends you, there, you can have like a random, random dimer model where the disorder is not completely uncorrelated, but um, two adjacent sites always have the same disorder potential, I think. So you have some correlation in the disorder. Then in one dimension, you can have a critical point. Like if you just have diagonal disorder, you know, any disorder will immediately localize the system. If you have correlated disorder, you can have a transition at a finite disorder strength. Um, and I think in those cases, you would get this log L behavior at the critical point. It's a very different setup. So in particular, I'm sitting deep in the face. I'm not, you know, at the phase transition, you know, you could imagine that the phase transition happened by having these log L size regions grow and kind of percolate. I'm not sure if that's a good picture for the transition or not. Um, but that, that's, I'm not even addressing that question here. Um, so I, th so I think this RG is, is, is kind of in a different setup. So I, get a different result. So I don't think this log L is necessarily called, you know, connected to that log L. Um, and, yeah, and then we said, this is only in certain regions of the system. This is not in the average. Like if, you take, if you take, say, quantiles of, you, you know, you take the distribution of cutting everywhere, every quantile of that will converge. But the maximum will diverge. So it's very different. Um, okay, so yeah, you cannot sit down and uh, try to make this informal definition here um, very precise, taking into account all these rare regions effects and so on. That ends up being very technical. Um, I thought a bit about how to present it in a non-technical way. Uh, let me just state it in words, basically. So by two desired accuracy, we mean that um, by measuring k local operators, you cannot distinguish these two states um, with the probability larger than some epsilon that you get to pick. Um, so we're only requiring a bound on trace norm distances of local reduced density matrices. And we cannot require something like the overlap of states to be large, because that'll be, that'll be completely killed by these rare regions. And then we have to kind of very carefully ask the question of how to approach the thermodynamic limit. So we work around that by only requiring that k local uh, correlators for some k that you choose beforehand cannot distinguish. And then for this almost everywhere, you have to work pretty hard to be able to approach the thermodynamic limit in a controlled way in the definition. So you kind of take a series of hypercubes <coughs> that eventually fill the whole lattice and you pick some fraction of, some fraction f strictly smaller than one. Um, and then out of every one of these hypercubes, you select some subregion of volume at least f um, on which this definition holds. And then you can kind of take the, con can take the thermodynamic limit in a controlled way. And so finally, then we can, we can use this definition to define a many-body localized phase as, as, as a phase described by some Hamiltonian H that um, where, where almost all eigenstates have this property. Almost all meaning that um, kind of the, the, the probability of you know, there exists some d such that the probability of finding a state with a, where you need a depth larger than d is exponentially small. Um, and an additional requirement you probably want to add is that this is stable to slightly changing the Hamiltonian. So, you know, that you can allow some, you can, you can add some small finite perturbation um, and this property survives. Otherwise, you'll get kind of all kinds of trivial systems that fulfill this. You could just take an easy model without field and it'll fulfill this definition but it will not as soon as you add any uh, magnetic field. Um, so if you're interested in all the glorious detail, you can look that up in the paper, or I can explain it later. Um, I'm going to use the last 10 minutes to uh, kind of sketch out an idea, um, which is actually why we originally started thinking about this, which is the possibility of having topological order uh, at finite temperature in such a system. And this is an idea that, that was at the same time uh, discussed by other groups. So uh, David Hughes and his collaborators at Princeton have studied this, and actually Ashwin and his collaborators have worked on this question as well in the 1D system. Um, so what's the problem with having topological order at finite temperature? Um, 
So let's consider, just for simplicity, a system on a, on a cylinder. You can imagine the toy code, but the same argument would apply basically to any um, topological phase. And maybe you want to imagine this not being at a fixed point in the sense that quasi-particles actually have some dispersion. It can be very weak dispersion, but you don't want to be you know, at a fixed point where quasi-particles don't move at all. So you prepare your system in some gone state, um, but let's say it's somehow coupled to an external bar. You have you know, cosmic rays coming in that put energy into the system, something like this. Um, and what will happen is that you can create a pair of quasi-particles. Uh, strictly speaking, particle-antiparticle pair. Um, this will be some finite energy excitation above the ground state. But if I'm at finite temperature, um, you know, there's a finite probability for that happening. Now, if these quasi-particles have some dispersion, so kind of created this pair locally, so they sit very close to each other. Now, they have some dispersion, so they're going to go move around. So you can imagine taking one of them two and having, having it kind of diffuse around the system and come back to its original location. So I'm going to take one of these particles and move it around the cylinder. So now it's come back to its original location, so I can annihilate it with uh, its, you know, brother. And so now I'm back in the ground state manifold because I have no quasi-particle excitations anymore. Um, the energy that I have you know, somehow gets pushed into that thermal bath or I emit some you know, photon or whatever. Um, and I'm back in the ground state manifold, but I'm not back in the state where I started. Right? If one of these particles moves along a topologically non-trivial loop, say around the cylinder, I've actually changed the state of my system. Um, and the probability for this whole procedure is exponentially small in the gap. Right, so the probability for thermally creating this pair is exponentially small in the energy of the pair over the temperature. But there's no, well, okay, and then there's the process of moving it around the cylinder, which is going to be polynomially suppressed in the system size. Right, so you can imagine maybe it's a diffusive process, so then it's like one of us. L squared, basically, maybe there's some factor for having it come back to its original location. But this is not exponentially <laughs> suppressed in the system size. This is only polynomially suppressed in the system size. So this is the argument that is usually given for why topological order or topological quantum memories are going to be unstable at any finite temperature. Um, so but so now, so if, if you take t to infinity, it's your best. It seems like if you take, make t arbitrarily large, you have high probability of success. Am I supposed to say, this is T over delta? Yes. That's true. No. Right, lunch temperatures, everything yeah. will be yeah. possible. Yeah. Yeah. They will be created from the block with high temperature, it's high temperature. It's OK. Everything will be locked. What is the probability of one more number? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I don't understand why it's, why it's polynomial suppression. If my quasi-particle has some mass, I expect the the action to be like the mass times the length of its world line as it goes around the cylinder. So shouldn't it be like e to the minus mass times the radius of the cylinder? Um, <coughs> I mean, if you just think of like, diff you know, say you have a system where you have diffusive transport, right? Then this particle is going to execute some kind of random walk, right? And so a random walk has a polynomially small probability of coming back to its original location. Crossing itself. If you're so telling that this is, would be the suppression if you have zero temperature, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the, yeah. the suppression at zero temperature, but it has finite temperature. So the energy is available there. It is not the real total power of running around. It's a real power. But I mean, in, in the lattice model, even if, you, even if you don't think so much about finite temperature, but like, you know, cosmic ray exciting this pair, um, if you then have some dispersion for these particles, they will diffuse. You know, once, once, they're, once they're created, they're not confined. So they, you know, there's no, the, the string that's kind of connecting them is, is, is not physical. It doesn't have any string tension, so you can just move them around. Um, okay, but this is kind of suggestive already in the context of what I've said. 
uh, for how I can fix this, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to localize the quasi particles. And so if I localize these quasi particles, I've basically broken the second step. So I can still locally create particle anti particle pairs, but they're they're not you know they're exponentially suppressed from moving around the cylinder. They just don't diffuse anymore. They're just stuck in their location. So you can create them. You can kind of locally annihilate them. But the probability of having them go along a non-trivial loop around the system is exponentially small. So instead of having one over poly here, this is not now going to be exponentially small in L over some uh, some characteristic length scale, which is going to be the localization length. Um, so by doing this, I've kind of fixed this problem with uh, topologic phases at finite temperature. Um, now, generically, these quasi-particles are interacting. So to be able to localize them, I need to know that many body localization exists. So these are interacting. And so therefore, I need many body localization. So I need to find a parameter regime in these models where the quasi-particles are many body localized, but have not destroyed kind of the underlying topological background of the state. Um, and OK, so in my last two minutes, let me just write down um, a specific example where we would hope this would happen. Um, so for example, you could just consider a toy code. So I have my vertex terms. Plaquette uh, terms, the usual stuff. Um, and now, to give the quasi particles some dispersion, let me add a magnetic field. Let me add magnetic field in two directions so that both electric and magnetic particles um, kind of get moved around by the action of this of this magnetic field. And now I'm going to add this order to this. So I'm going to choose these um, these terms here. Uh, to be disordered, so, so we can just add box disorder around some uh, so some 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 window of disorder W, some uniform distribution. So the the both the uh, vertex and the plaquette term. I'm going to choose the coupling from some disorder distribution that has some uh, mean uh, that is finite. You will stay positive, right? Hmm? Positive? Yes, yes, yes. So I'm going to write that down in a second. So the interesting regime is where these magnetic fields, which are basically the hopping uh, terms for these quasi-particles, are much smaller than this disorder strength, W. But at the same time, this W needs to be much smaller than um, the mean value of the uh, plaquette and vertex term. Right, so this is the regime where we expect this to happen. So all of this happens on a scale that is much smaller than the gap. The gap is set by uh, these. Right, so if I make this disorder strong compared to the gap, I'm just completely going to destroy everything in the system. So that's not good. Um, so I need a regime where the gap is very large, disorder is small compared to the gap, but disorder is strong compared to the hopping terms for the quasi-particles. And so this would be the regime where I expect the quasi-particles to be many-body localized, and thus this uh, topological phase to be stable at finite temperatures, and indeed in this case maybe in at, 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 in all eigenstates of the system. Um, this is of course a very hard problem to study numerically. Numerically, you can then uh, look at some 1D symmetry protected phase and kind of reach a similar parameter regime. And this was actually done by Ashwin and his collaborators. Some 1D uh, symmetry protected chain where you can observe that the edge states remain stable at uh, very high energy densities if you if you tune into a similar parameter regime. And yeah, there's a lot of time, so uh, yeah. Thank you, and I'll take questions. So in this last discussion, what was the goal of having a sufficiently large gap? Is it because you wanted to be at sufficiently small temperatures? 
with respect to the gap or, or not? Well, so it may not be so obvious in the toy code, but for example, um, if, you, if you would try to do this for a, uh, like a Majorana chain, like a Kitaev model in 1D, if you make the on-site disorder large compared to the gap, you actually drive a phase transition into this Majorana metal phase. Um, so you would get delocalized states at low energies driven by disorder. So some kind of Griffith effect would lead to delocalization. It's not clear whether the same would happen in the toy code, but, uh, but something like that would probably happen. You'd, you'd, you'd have regions that are out of the topological phase entirely. But, but then you still want it, I mean, at least to be safe, are you asking that the gap be large enough? Yeah. And, and how, do you foresee, uh, how do you think about preparing this system? I mean, we don't have thermalization there, right? So uh, I don't know what temperature means. Yeah, so temperature is a bit of a, I, I try to avoid it in most of it. This is really um, at finite energy density. So for example, in this, in this 1D setup, what you can do is in, instead of preparing the system in a low energy state, you prepare the system in a completely random product state, which is basically a very high energy state. Right. And then you observe that even in that high energy initial state, as you consider the dynamics of the system, the edge states remain stable. And you know, if the growth of the system size, the, the time scale for the edge, uh, grows exponentially and so on. Uh, like for, for this protection of this quantum order, is this pure localization enough? Or, <coughs> I mean, if I, if I look at this model and I say, okay, now I find that the system is in a many way localized state, does it automatically tell me that I have protected quantum order? Or do I also have to consider maybe the defect density? Or, I mean, remember, like in David's I mean, paper, I, there's some regime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, um, localized power market. And only right. if the localization length, say, is, uh, is, is short compared to the average distance of defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Has actually protected order. Yeah, I think basically all the, all the conservations that previously applied to having many body localization for the original degrees of freedom now applies to having many body localization for the excitations. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, you know, if, if the, if the quasi particles are so dense that their localization volume overlaps, that would basically mean that the hopping becomes very large. So then, still, um, and so then, like, the, the uh, order is washed off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I should have maybe said that having topological order at finite temperature is, is one example out of the general paradigm of having quantum order at finite temperature. I think this phrase was used by David Hughes. And I mean, for example, you can observe quantum spin glasses at finite temperature and all kinds of things. Do you See any room for having some phase that satisfies this weak definition of MBO, but not the stronger one that you use the same? Uh, do you know any example? That's a very good question. Um, well, the, so the question is: um, Is it actually important that we allow this U to be different for all eigenstates? Uh, you know, is is it for all physical models actually sufficient to take one U for the whole spectrum? Um, I mean, okay, so there's the problem of having a mobility edge. Um, but, but if you consider states that are kind of below the mobility edge, I really don't know. So you have two definitions here for localized. You have people say that the localized system is one where all the eigenstates should be able, mm -hmm. almost all should be able. And then you have this other one that it's connected to a product state. Right. Like, at least in one day, can you show the other equivalents? No. So no. an excited state that has area load, you know, should be, you can't assume that there's an idea. Right. So I can't show anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe somebody else can. Um, there's, there's kind of obvious problems in one direction. So if you, um, if you want to show that this implies an area law, uh, here we only apply k, um, uh, uh, 1k local operators to be within some accuracy on the trace from distance, um, that's probably not enough to show an area law. Like even if you have things that are very close in trace from distance on, uh, like, you know, locally, they can have completely different entanglement properties, at least if you look at kind of naive bounds. So all of these proofs for, for having area laws in, in, in 1D systems and so on imply the locality of the Hamiltonian and the gap and so on actually doesn't go like this at all, but you need to leave arguments and bonds, things like that. Um, so maybe somebody who understands how to prove like the area law in 1D very deeply can make this precise, but it seems very difficult. Um, 
I think physically it seems kind of intuitive. I mean, physically it seems to be hard to imagine that you can have eigenstates of a local Hamiltonian um, that fulfill one but not the other definition. Um, but I can't make that mathematically. Sorry, precise. fulfill which two? Uh, having this finite depth local unitary and having an area law for but almost all of What about symmetry breaking? Oh, all of this, I mean... You have a GSF, right? Yes. Maybe the ground state of the AIG model with no magnetic field. Yes. Would you accept that one? Because it fulfills the AIG law, but you cannot find this finite... Oh, but, but it doesn't fulfill the uh, kind of stability to, uh, to preserving the Hamiltonian. I see. Which you I've kind of swept that under the rug because I've talked mostly right. about states, but as soon as you talk about the Hamiltonian, you need to include that. Otherwise, there's a ton of trivial examples like that. Um, but the, all of those are unstable to adding a small perturbation. <coughs> um, right, if there's no more questions, can we skip it again? Now we have lunch break, and I think we resume at 1.30.